No, I don't know. What? Welcome back. Last time, we asked the question, what's a drug? And by looking at the midbrain reward biology, we saw that that's not really the right question. It should be, what's a reward? Because a lot of things act like drugs in the brain of a person with addiction. And it's not about the drug, it's about the brain. So if you stop drinking and instead start overeating, well, that's not recovery, that's not sobriety, that's still active addiction with something that people don't consider a drug anymore. But the brain doesn't know the difference. The brain doesn't care where the dopamine comes from. And that brings us to today's question. What's a medicine? Because when I talk to families and patients about taking medication and as part of addiction treatment, I often hear the question, well, why would you want to give one drug to replace another? Well, we don't. Just like we don't want to replace a drug with a reward, we don't want to replace a drug with a drug. So let's talk about the difference between a drug and a medicine. A drug is something I take right now to change how I feel right now, regardless of what it's going to do in the future. A medicine is something I take because someone else thinks it's a good idea, even though it doesn't do anything for how I feel right now, because of what it's going to do for me in the future. So what makes something a medicine? What makes it a drug? Part of that is about the molecule. Now that's the part that everybody's focused on. Heroin's a drug. Aspirin's a medicine. But that's only part of the story. The other part is your response to the molecule. And one thing could be a drug for your neighbor and be a medicine for you. So what do we look at? We look at how fast does it get through to your brain? How long does it do what it's doing in your brain? Does it get in there quick and run away quick, causing a kind of a spike? Or does it get in slowly and stay there a very long time, just raising your tone? Does it affect a particular target in the reward system? Or does it do a whole bunch of things? A lot of times, medications that cross to a bunch of different receptors, do a bunch of things at once, can be very complicated and have different effects in different people depending on their genetics. When a medication does just one thing, it's a lot easier to handle and a lot easier to figure out exactly what it's doing. These questions come up from families often when a person's in addiction treatment and we talk, start talking about a medicine, family often gets worried or a person who's taking a medicine wants to come off the medicine because they've heard at a meeting that this is a bad thing to be on. Here's a classic example. It's just one example, but it's probably the one that's coming to everybody's mind because it gets the most press, so we'll use it. Buprenorphine for people with addiction involving opioids. Buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. That means it turns on the opioid receptor part of the way, as opposed to heroin that turns it on all of the way. It's a very long-acting partial opioid agonist, so you only have to take it once a day, whereas heroin, for instance, you have to take multiple times a day. So what if somebody said to me, why would you want to put this person on buprenorphine? Why are you trading just one drug for another? And here's usually what I ask the patient. When you took the heroin, did it make you high? And the patient will say, yes. When you took the heroin, did it make you want to take more heroin? The patient usually says, yes. When you took the heroin, did it make you do dumb things that you regretted later? And the patient usually says, yes. And then I'll say, when you take the buprenorphine, does it make you want to take more buprenorphine? No. Does it make you high? Nope. Does it make you do stupid things you regret later? Nope. So it may be an opioid sitting there in the box or in a test tube, but it doesn't act like an opioid in the addicted brain. 
So it's not so much about the molecule. Just like last week, it's not so much about the behavior. Alcohol is bad. Exercise is good. No, it's about what your brain's doing with that. Same thing today. It's not about the molecule. It's about what your brain's doing with the molecule. One last example. Taking a medicine is like tying your shoe in the morning. You don't do it because it makes you feel good. You do it so you don't trip later in the day. Just in case anybody's got the idea that I'm a big touter of medicines, or I've only been in this for the medicine, or I'm a doctor, I give people medicines. I started in my addiction medicine practice not giving anyone any medicines. I started as one of those addiction medicine doctors who said everyone only needs 12-step recovery. That's all you need, and you don't need medicines, and medicines will keep you from 12-step recovery. That's what I believed. That's what I said. To be frank, I was wrong. I watched too many people not get into recovery. I watched too many people die of addiction. That's what changed my mind. And since I started using medicines for addiction, I've gotten far more people into recovery than I ever did before. Which brings me to next week's subject. Recovery culture. Because there are a lot of different recovery cultures that change the brain, and not all of them are based on 12 steps, and while just like a medicine might be right for you and not right for another person, a recovery culture might be right for you and not right for another person. So let's talk next week about how we get everybody involved in recovery from addiction so that we can really end it as a problem in American life. I hope you join me. Until then, be well.